So uh, yeah, hi everybody again. Um, so we have the pleasure to have uh, Afsal uh, here, Afsal Siddiqui. Uh, I think uh, I've known Afsal for quite some time, but this is the first day I meet him in person. <laughs> so it's uh, really nice, uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, Afsal has a very nice uh, background uh, and CV. Uh, he's been in uh, Colombia, he's been in Berkeley, he did his PhD with Schmuloren, and today he's a, he's a professor both at uh, UCL and in Stockholm. And also, uh, you kept your title as professor in Montreal. Uh, I'm an affiliate professor there. Affiliate at yeah. HEC in Montreal, which is the best uh, business school in Canada, arguably. The best French-speaking business school okay. oh. in <laughs> Quebec. Okay, they, 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 in Canada. you know, they go over this part when you ask yeah, them. Yeah. No, it's an extremely good uh, business school. So uh, Afsal uh, is working on, uh, on a wide range of problems. He's been interacting a lot with a friend of ours, uh, Trine Boomsma, in uh, Copenhagen. And I think you also have a, a connection to Daniel Kuhn, uh, like Christos, through Paola. Uh, yes, right? exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Afsal does a lot of interesting work, and you will be sharing uh, some of, of this today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and the introduction. So, we've had a very uh, detailed model presented right now, which hopefully provides us with insights on how to move forward. And it's also related to the, the work of, of Christos. So I thought I would go in a different direction and do something that is not as detailed and is much more stylized so that we can try to generalize some of the insights. So the objective of this work is to see, uh, and by the way, this is with Sebastian Devia and Pierre Olivier Pinot from HSC Montreal. So we have a joint project together uh, to look at these kinds of problems in which we uh, acknowledge that the power system is in trying to incorporate more intermittent renewables uh, which is then going to uh, make other technologies perhaps in a stronger position. Those technologies that are more flexible are going to have more leverage. And then what we want to investigate is how are they going to use that leverage in the market. Uh, and then if you go a level above that as a policymaker, if you know that someone is going to use that additional leverage for exercising market power, how can you redesign the market or come up with a new policy to try to mitigate the effects of that? So here we're looking at potentially conflicting objectives because if you look at a flexible technology like storage, the conventional view of storage is that, uh, yes, it could be used in a socially beneficial way. Uh, basically, you try to take uh, excess power from the grid and pump it up using pumped hydro. And then when there is a, a deficiency in, in, the, in, in the market, you release power and you, and you, or you release water and you produce power during those hours. So this is the conventional view, and it's a very benign view of storage, that it would always be used in this welfare-enhancing way. Uh, but as the market has become liberalized, uh, the owners of storage are not going to have necessarily the same incentives as those of society. So what we're talking about here is private uh, incentives that are going to be in conflict with social incentives, which will lead to uh, use of storage, which is not potentially not welfare enhancing. So looking at another flexible technology, gas-fired power plants, we have seen in a very simple sense that this problem has arisen in Germany as well, where you can see uh, this is a chart from several years ago, so perhaps the problem is more severe now. I don't know. This is a snapshot of the residual load, which is the uh, demand minus the wind and the solar. So this is the blue stuff, and it's being read off of the left-hand uh, axis. And then you can see during some hours, there's so much wind and solar being produced that you actually have negative net buy volume. Uh, and coincidentally, during those hours, the price in red is also crashing to zero or to negative prices, which is being read off of the right-hand axis. So you can see that over these two or three days, the price of electricity is 24 euros a megawatt hour, maybe going up to 43 euros a megawatt hour, whereas gas-fired power plants are bidding in at 45 euros per megawatt hour. So uh, somewhat paradoxically, in this kind of setting, 
you need the flexibility, you need the gas-fired power plants, but because of what's happening in the market, they're just simply not going to be viable. So again, society needs this flexibility, but as a private producer, why would I ever want to enter this market where I'm not going to be making any money? So that's an example from a different setting, but again, looking at the role of flexibility. Going back to storage, this is also posing problems for regulators because they don't know how to deal with storage. Is it, uh, is it a generator? Is it a load? What, what is it? And in fact, a few years ago in Texas, there was this utility called Encore that wanted to invest in grid-scale storage for the purpose of mitigating um, congestion. Uh, the regulator in Texas studied their uh, their, their case and then eventually ended up rejecting it because they said even though you're a, you are a utility and you have specified what you want to use storage for because the way the electricity industry has been restructured we cannot allow a utility to own something that looks like generators okay we can't allow that so this is perhaps a very uh, rigid perspective of the industry uh, so we think that regulators as well as producers need to take a more nuanced approach in order to examine the different roles that storage can play in order to identify the potentially uh, conflicting objectives that will arise and then propose market-based solutions for getting around those, uh, for, uh, those uh, conflicts and perhaps aligning the incentives in a more intelligent way. So, we really try to take a, a stylized approach. Uh, this is a, a, an equilibrium analysis in which we abstract away from a lot of the real world details so we can prove certain things. Uh, so we are not looking at uncertainty, we're not looking at transmission constraints. We're going to have a simple two period model uh, with a renewable energy generator that has storage and a thermal generator that is producing emissions. So we include the role of emissions because a lot of the early work on electricity markets that did look at storage uh, looked at particularly uh, hydropower producers. For example, there's a paper by Kramp and Moreau that shows how market power can actually lower water value. Uh, and this has been shown also empirically by Bushnell in a California case study. Basically what they're saying is that if you have market power in a hydrothermal system, what happens is that the hydropower producers, because they cannot be seen to spill the water, what they want to do is to withhold power during the peak periods in order to raise the prices. Since the regulator will see that they're spilling the water, they can't do that. So what they do is they have a fixed stock of water. They try to dump it in the off-peak period to lower the price. The price is low in the off-peak period anyway. So if it goes lower, it doesn't really hurt them. By that, they can raise the price even more in the peak period and then make higher profits. And in fact, they do it to such an extent that the water value becomes negative. So water value means how much are you willing to pay for an additional unit of storage? If I'm a Corneau producer, I'm putting a negative value on that because I want someone to take my water away from me so I can raise the price. And also, uh, you find in this kind of setting that a Corneau producer actually produces more in the off-peak period than a perfectly competitive producer. So clearly storage is not being used in a socially optimal way. It's not the case that you are uh, allocating the resource across all periods such that the marginal benefit is being equalized. It's actually the marginal revenue of the producer that is being equalized. So there's a dif different outcome. So, um, yeah, and there was another paper that looks at how this would work under uncertainty, but basically this early work, it looked at uh, problems with market power and had a niche with hydropower, but it did not do anything involving carbon policy. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, carbon policy was simply not an issue. Um, also, they by focusing on hydropower, they didn't look at any kind of generic storage device that would have efficiency losses. And in more recent years, Sio Shansi has been developing these equilibrium models in which he's been trying more methodically to, sh to identify cases in which storage can actually be degrading for welfare. 
Uh, and he shows that in particular when there's generator owned storage and generators have market power, they're going to lead to very different outcomes in the market. Uh, but still, he doesn't look at carbon policy. Uh, so that's kind of where we're trying to go is to look at a generic storage device with efficiency losses in the presence of carbon policy. How are the outcomes going to be different under market power as opposed to a perfectly competitive setting? And our work is in the spirit of this paper by Downward et al, in which they show how a carbon tax can actually increase emissions in the presence of market power because it makes the gas-fired power plant so cheap that it actually increases its production. So it's sort of like a rebound effect. Okay, so um, I think everybody here knows this before the industry was vertically integrated, now it's been restructured. So instead of having a central planning type model, we're using an equilibrium approach as indicated there. And the objective here is to see how these different aspects come together. How does storage, producers' incentives, and social welfare, how are they impacted by market power, carbon policy, and the efficiency of the device? Uh, basically what we find is that the main findings from Bushnell which is about more off-peak renewable production and a negative marginal value of storage uh, under market power, they will start to be reversed when there is a carbon tax. Because what happens when there's a carbon tax? First of all, there's a direct effect in which there's a thermal producer who is creating emissions. If you put a carbon tax, that thermal producer will reduce its production. That's the direct effect. At the same time, by imposing a carbon tax, what's going to happen is that it's going to make, um, incentivize the renewal, renewable production to increase in both the off-peak and the peak periods. But then, as a result, the marginal value of renewable energy will increase. Because of the efficiency loss, it will increase the marginal cost more in the peak period than in the off-peak period, which then, as an indirect effect, will lead the renewable producer to shift its stock to the off-peak period, and then, therefore, it's going to lead to a, a reversal of the, of the first, uh, of the first uh, effect, which is you have more off-peak renewable energy production only under market power. We say no, with a carbon tax, you will have more off-peak production across the board. And also, we find that because the price increases more in the peak period, you may actually end up increasing peak thermal production under perfect competition. So this is a perverse outcome of a carbon tax where the price, of the, the price goes higher under the peak period and the indirect effect is to induce an increase in the thermal production. So that's one thing we find when you int introduce a carbon tax. A lot of the standard findings from the literature about the use of storage start to fall apart. Also, uh, the impact of efficiency is uh, kind of counterintuitive or seemingly counterintuitive. Under uh, market power, uh, it has a straightforward uh, monotonic effect. What happens is that if you have a very inefficient device and you're a Corneau producer and I say, okay, I'm going to increase the efficiency of your storage device. You can take more energy from one period and send it to another. How much more are you willing to pay? You'll say, well, I'm willing to pay less. I don't want you to give, improve my, my efficiency. I want less of this renewable energy. What are you doing? So in that case, it's monotonically decreasing as the efficiency increases, the marginal willingness to pay for an additional capacity of storage. So for a, a Corneau producer, there's a monotonic effect. But for a perfectly competitive producer, there's a non-monotonic effect. First of all, what happens is that, let's say that you have a very inefficient storage device. You go to a perfectly competitive producer and you say, I'm going to increase your efficiency. How much are you willing to pay? You'll say, oh, more efficiency means I can shift more energy to the peak period. Yeah, I'm willing to pay more. So the marginal value is increasing, but you get to a certain point when you will actually be having so much extra energy during the peak period that it'll start to depress the price and then the perfectly competitive producer will actually want to pay less for the additional unit of uh, energy that it's going to get from the higher efficiency. So the marginal willingness to pay increases first in the efficiency 
and then it reaches a turning point and it actually starts to decrease because there's actually too much energy uh, being produced in the peak period. And what that it, do, it then does is it tries to put more energy in the off-peak period. So even a perfectly competitive producer starts to behave like a, Cournot mono, like a Cournot oligopolist by trying to dump more energy in the off-peak period because it has too much energy. Yes? Interesting, and, and I'm then uh, thinking, is there a way to, to, to find a, a closed form solution, an analytical expression that would determine this uh, optimal efficiency uh, as a function of market characteristics? So I don't know, some kind of, I don't know, if we say it, it's a quadratic uh, a supply curve in the market based on the coefficient of this uh, quadratic supply curve or something? Because you say, if we, if we have that, we can actually inform the, 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 the technology obsessed people and say, you know, actually, uh, storage of efficiency I don't know, 75% is good enough. If we go for more, it's not going to do any good, right? So c can we find this kind of expression, or I it's only through simulation that we know that this point exists, but it's very difficult to, to find where it is? Yes. That's, that's this one. OK, sorry. That's my answer. <laughs> my answer is yes. But I will show you as, uh, in, in the model, because it's a stylized model, so you can find a lot, but not all of these turning points, but you can identify most of them. Um, and then the other thing is, what can you actually do? Because actually, if you look at it from a social perspective, more device, higher device efficiency reduces emissions and it increases welfare. But from a private perspective, even as a perfectly competitive producer, more efficiency first increases my profits, and then when the device is too efficient, it's actually going to start to decrease my profits. So then you see that there is a conflict between the private incentive and the public incentive. Now, if you're a policymaker, like you say, what can you do? Well, maybe saying, don't do any more research in, uh, in storage efficiency after 75%. Maybe that doesn't look good. But what you would actually want to do is, is, to, get, is to bring the, the private producer along and say, no, look, this is going to increase your profit as well. One way to do it is to impose a carbon tax, because what the carbon tax does, first of all, is it increases the marginal value of storage. And then secondly, what the carbon tax does is it makes you put more energy in the off-peak period anyway, which obviates the need for more the, the, the impact of this storage efficiency. So it aligns the incentives to a greater extent. There's still going to be a turning point, but it's going to happen at 95% rather than 75%. I didn't understand why uh, higher efficiency is not uh, wished by the by the non uh, by the uh, perfectly competitive with, uh, the storage with uh, that is not perfectly competitive. Oh, by the power. by the Cornell Cornell yes. producer. Yeah. So the Cornell producer basically has a fixed stock of renewable resource. There's an off-peak period and a peak period. It can decide how much to produce in each period. If it saves the stock for the peak period, there's like an efficiency loss. So it can't, it can't dump uh, the, the excess resource. So what it does is it actually tries to use it more in the off-peak period. So if it's using it in the off-peak period and the efficiency is high, then there's still going to be more left over in the peak period, which it doesn't want. Mm -hmm. So its valuation of... The re of the of the marginal value of storage is always negative. Okay, so it's if you are inefficient, it's, let's say that you are able to spill water faster. Let's say I yeah. mean in higher amounts. Yeah. So yes. Can you grab it? <laughs> so, so, so in a sense, what you are saying is that you are reproducing here with storage exactly what happened with the with the hydro, right? So, so but to some extent, because we have efficiency losses, exactly. which creates more interesting yeah. and general insights. Yeah, but think. this is fundamentally it's the same market, market yeah, behavior. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so why can't you have a market where actually hydro and, and storage cannot, cannot play on the market in a sense? So the, the, the price is not determined by what they do. So they, they are, you know, the price is determined only by, by let's say, the generators, the, 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 the people who are really producing, right? So not, they cannot play like this. So, so would that make sense? Well, I mean, it's, 
it's it's uh, it's treated as as a generating resource, I know, right? But can you so? But so you would have to change the entire no, regulatory no, but, framework. But the, the point I think you, you had a quotation from Texas. There is exactly the same issue that came up in California in the mm -hmm. U.S. And there were actually two rulings that were contra contradictory with each other. So you could view storage as part of the generation, but you could also view it as part of transmission, right? Mm -hmm. It's something that can eliminate congestion and things like this. So if you view it as transmission, it's very different. It doesn't take, it's not a generating unit any, anymore. Mm -hmm. it's, so, it's something that's gonna handle congestion. And so if you view it that way, it's a very different, it, it doesn't play inside the market. It's, it just, it's just kind of a virtual line concept or something like mm -hmm. this. Right? Yeah. And so, so if you see that, if you see that, don't you think that you would get out, get out of these paradoxes? Uh, yes, uh, to some extent, but then who would be the owner of that resource? Who would be operating? So, so one, one of the things I'm very interested in, in, in looking into is if you can have the transmission operator owning this, but they are actually yeah. only using this for you know, congestion management. But for, FERC, to my understanding, has not looked favorably upon ISOs owning storage. No, but I, 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 I don't know yep. that. But yep. I, think, I think, you know, FERC is, FERC is FERC. I mean, we, we are scientists, right? So we yep. can yep. say this is the right way to Sure, do. sure. But it's the idea of having a storage as a system asset, not agent exactly, asset. Exactly. And this is why we have this financial storage right idea, just to, to make sure that this mm. storage will be used as a system asset and then uh, there is some uh, revenue streams for that, right? Yeah, makes sense. But, yeah, yeah. But it, I mean, the fact, the fact that it's a, it's a resource for the transmission system doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that it's not actually making the system better. It will, right? So mm, yeah. it will make it will uh, improve it will improve this part. It will yeah. lower the cost of this part. But it's not it's not it's not a product it's not a producing unit. Anymore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, well, well, I mean, that's basically, uh, that's basically my whole uh, presentation. Uh, the rest is just uh, to answer your questions about how it's done. So here we can go into the mathematics. So much simpler than your model, uh, but because we want to find closed form solutions. So we assume that there are two periods, one and two, they correspond to off-peak and peak. By that, we mean that uh, the intercept of the inverse demand is always going to be higher in the, in the peak period. There's no uncertainty or transmission constraints, so sorry it takes away what you were trying to say, but I'm sure you can include it in a, a more uh, detailed model. So we have an equilibrium approach with uh, two producers. There's a storage-enabled renewable energy producer. So like I said, this renewable energy producer has uh, uh, no cost of production, uh, but basically it has a finite resource. It has a given resource and then it has to decide how to allocate it between those two periods with an efficiency loss. And then there is a thermal producer which has a quadratic uh, cost function and it's producing emissions so it could be hit with a carbon tax. Okay, so uh, the inverse demand function in each period is linear. Like I said, period two is the uh, peak one. Uh, renewable energy production has no explicit cost. The available capacity of the resource is D, which can also be interpreted as the size of, the, of your storage unit that you've got. Uh, and you're facing this constraint where the renewable production in period one plus F times the renewable production in period two has to equal D, where F is something that's greater than or equal to one. So if F is equal to one, we're talking about hydropower, but it's more interesting to talk about a generic storage device. And it's an equality constraint rather than less than or equal to because uh, we don't want you to be able to spill this resource. The regulator will look very unfavorably upon that. Uh, the thermal cost production, like I said, is quadratic. Uh, and you have an emission rate R and you can be hit with this carbon tax. The only assumptions we make here are that A2 is greater than F times A1. So it's period two is the peak period. And for interior solutions, to get interior solutions across the board, the sufficient condition is that this C parameter, the marginal cost of the thermal producer has to be greater than 0.17. So those are the only assumptions we make. So we try to make this as general as possible. First of all, let's look at the renewable energy producer's problem. Problem is to maximize uh, profits subject to the uh, resource availability constraint Profits are just the revenues in period one plus the revenues in period two. 
the mu is the shadow price on the, on the resource. So this is equivalent to the water value from the hydropower problem. We're going to use this to help gain some more insights about the marginal value of storage in this context. So it's a convex optimization problem. It can be replaced by its KKT condition. So we have these three KKT conditions. Of course, if you're perfectly competitive, then these twos disappear. But basically what this is saying is that in each period, you're going to produce until, if it's an interior solution, marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, where marginal cost is the marginal value of storage, except that in period two, it's going to be F times mu, where F is the rate of your efficiency loss. Okay, so for the thermal producer, it's an unconstrained optimization problem taking into account the revenues from sales in period one, period two, cost of production in period one, period two, and the carbon tax that's being imposed in periods one and two. Uh, so this is also convex. It can be replaced by its KKT conditions. Again, if it's perfectly competitive, the twos will disappear. And the first order necessary conditions for an interior solution imply that the marginal revenue equals the marginal cost of production plus the carbon tax that's levied. So what we're doing, uh, just to give you a note, is that this is an open loop approach. There are two periods, but the decisions are being made as if they were being made all at once. We also did a closed loop spe specification. So instead of an MCP, we solve it as an EPEC. Uh, Kromp and Muro also did this. It doesn't change the qualitative results at all. The only thing that happens is that the renewable energy producer is able to anticipate the response of the thermal producer and is therefore able to shift more energy to the peak period because it knows that the thermal producer is going to produce less. That's the only thing that happens. Okay, so the solutions under perfect competition are nice and interior as follows. And here's the interior solutions for Corneau oligopoly. As you can see, it's beautiful. Uh, but what we want to do is to, so this is, I think, one thing that uh, we do that perhaps other papers that take a similar approach don't do. We don't just assume that all the solutions are going to be, clo are going to be interior. We specify the conditions that need to hold for these solutions to be interior. So we specify the interior solution set where all the solutions are interior and for perfect competition and for Corneau oligopoly and in order to compare this directly with the Bushnell paper with the marginal value of renewable energy storage negative. So for perfect competition, we have to draw some cutting planes. So we're drawing, here's the D axis, here is the tax axis. And then basically, you have to draw the different interior solutions and make sure that they're intersecting. Uh, where they're intersecting, you're able to bound the values of D and T. Okay, so this is very tedious. I'm not going to go into the details. But basically, you want to stay within this region or you want to stay within this region. So you have to find where all these different lines can possibly intersect. So that's a lot of fun. The first author, he likes doing this kind of stuff. Okay, so algebraically, you can specify uh, the interior solution using this lemma. What are the limits on T and D? Same thing for Corneau oligopoly. Actually, for Corneau oligopoly, it's a lot easier because there's only this thing over here. This, you need to stay, you need to live within this triangle. So that specifies upper limit for D, lower limit for D, and an upper limit for T. So actually, this one is a lot easier to specify. But wait, that's not all. Because now, I want to make sure that this triangle, when it intersects with this triangle, it needs to be existing. So then I need another one to make sure that everything is coming together. So there's even another lamb which gets even more complicated. I'm not, I, we didn't even bother to draw the picture for that. But there is a proof. So. You can check out the paper if you're really interested. Anyway, the reason why we do it is so that when we perform comparative statics, we're comparing like with like. We're always living within the interior solutions for both perfect competition and Corneau oligopoly. So we never go outside of that. OK, the main results, first of all, with uh, carbon policy, 
what happens is uh, that uh, under perfect competition, if you have uh, carbon tax, you are going to shift renewable energy production from the, off, from the peak period to the off-peak period. And there's going to be a situation in which the thermal production in the peak period can actually increase. If the marginal cost of thermal production is relatively low, what can happen is that you have an increase in the price in the peak period as an indirect effect, peak thermal production can actually go up, which might be counterproductive from the perspective of carbon policy. You don't, you don't want that to happen. The results under Corneau oligopoly are much more straightforward. They mirror the effects, and you don't have this counterintuitive result because you have reduction in peak and off-peak thermal production with the carbon tax no matter what. The other thing that happens is that as the carbon tax increases, the marginal value of renewable energy storage increases. So the Bushnell result can also be reversed here where it's no longer going to have a negative value under Corneau oligopoly. Uh, and then finally, you could actually end up having more off-peak renewable energy generation under Corneau oligopoly only for a low carbon tax. So again, that Bushnell result will be reversed. I'll just show you the picture for that. So here are the main results for, uh, for the carbon policy. So as you can see, as the tax increases, the marginal value of storage increases under perfect competition and under Corno oligopoly. Under Corno oligopoly, Bushnell said it's negative. But if you increase it and we can specify the threshold, it will actually become positive again. Uh, here we have the renewable energy production with the carbon tax. And here we have the off-peak renewable energy production with Corneau oligopoly and here under perfect competition. So this was what was happening under market power, which was that the Corneau oligopolist was actually producing more in the off-peak period than the perfect, perfectly competitive producer. But now as the carbon tax increases, this result will be reversed as well. Here is the impact on the thermal production as the carbon tax increases. So we selected the parameters so that C is relatively small, you can see that the peak thermal production, the top line, is actually going to start increasing. We can also look at the producer profits. What happens as carbon tax increases? Thermal producers' profits decrease. Renewable energy producer profits increase. And increase in the uh, carbon tax reduces emissions and it reduces welfare. Okay, so uh, next thing was the impact of storage uh, uh, size. So here the results are not very uh, counterintuitive. Everything is as expected. If you have more of the resource, you're going to produce more renewable energy. You're going to produce less thermal energy. And the marginal value of storage is going to go down. Here are the interesting results with the efficiency of the device. Here, we can prove all this only when the carbon tax is zero, but then I'll show you the numerical results that indicate that this holds even when the carbon tax is any positive amount. What happens is that as you have an increase in efficiency, so, um, well, it's just easier to show it in the, in the diagram, but basically what's happening is that the cutoff point can be calculated. So this is the critical threshold efficiency level after which the marginal value of storage is going to start to decrease with a perfectly competitive producer. So to answer your question, yes, we found it. And then it's much easier to explain it with the picture. OK, so we're starting over here. So F equals 2 means that this is a 50% efficient device. OK, if I am a perfectly competitive producer and there's no carbon tax, I ask, how much are you willing to pay for an additional unit of storage? Oh, I'm willing to pay $12. OK. If I increase the efficiency, oh, I'm willing to pay a little bit more and a little bit more. Until I get to F equals 1.6, after that point, I'm actually able to put too much energy in the peak period, and I'm depressing the price. So now I'm saying, now wait a minute. I don't want the efficiency to increase. I'm willing to pay less and less. OK, so this is the cutoff point here, 1.6. If you add a carbon tax, you get the same kind of effect, but the turning point is much later. It's happening at 1.05. So 
you can see that by introducing the carbon tax, you're able to align the private incentives of the renewable energy producer with those of society. If you are exerting market power and you are a Corno oligopolist, if you have a 50% efficient device, you're kind of happy with that. I mean, you have a negative, you're putting a negative value on it anyway, but still, someone comes along and says, hey, I'm going to improve your efficiency. How much are you willing to pay? You're saying, I'm giving you $10 so you don't do this for me, okay? And this amount keeps getting larger and larger. You're saying, you're trying to bribe the person not to do research in improving uh, efficiency of the device. Okay, so what, how does this change in efficiency impact the production decisions? If you are a renewable energy producer and there's no carbon tax, what happens is that if the device is very inefficient and then I come along and I try to improve the efficiency, what you do is you reduce the production in the off-peak period so that you can use the increased efficiency to produce more try to produce more in the peak period. But then when you get to the turning point, now you have too much energy, now you start to increase production in the off-peak period again to get rid of that excess energy. Same turning point happens when there's a carbon tax, but for a much lower uh, level of F or a much higher level of efficiency. Thermal production is pretty much as expected. Uh, as the efficiency increases, you're producing less and less from the thermal unit, except in the off-peak period when you're perfectly competitive to counterbalance what's happening with the renewable energy producer. Renewable energy producer is reducing its production in the off-peak period, so the thermal production is ramping up, up to this point when the renewable energy producer now actually starts to make more in the off-peak period, so then the off-peak thermal production starts to go down. Same kind of pattern here with the carbon tax. Producer profits. So here we can see that this is the profit of the perfectly competitive renewable energy producer. It increases and then it starts to decrease. Same thing with the, uh, with under Corno oligopoly. The profit of the thermal producer is always going down with the uh, efficiency of the device. But this turning point happens for a much smaller value of F if there's a carbon tax. On the other hand, when you look at it from society's perspective, more efficient device is desirable, leads to less emissions. It's desirable, it increases social welfare. So I want to make the producer, the, th the renewable energy producer with this storage device, try to uh, take the same perspective as society and the carbon tax can do that. So that's basically uh, the whole story here. Carbon tax is able to align the private and social incentives more effectively. And it's able to circumvent the problem where higher device efficiency might be resisted by producers. So, yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot. That was super interesting, but I'd like to build on what Pascal was saying. When we have basically these results of, uh, uh, let's say, it's it's socially efficient, but yep. not seen from the side of the, the let's say, the individual agents. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where we have to, to to design an additional layer, so you can go extreme and push this and make it become an asset. Yep. Or otherwise, I mean, the point of a flexibility market or any kind of premium would be to say, well, we know you're doing something for us, so now let's just design some kind of top-ups you're going to get yep. so as to counteract for this effect, right? Yeah, exactly. So, is there hope we can actually design this kind of thing? So uh, I think the, the, the premium would be easier to design than this extra market because otherwise yep. we're going to have to coordinate everything. And uh, yep. So <coughs> have you gone towards that? Or? Well, uh, yeah, so there, there is a related paper that deals with storage investments, so it also takes a stylized approach. It's a bi-level model. At the upper level, we have either a welfare maximizing storage pr producer or a profit maximizing merchant storage investor. So this is work with Ramtin and Antonio. And in that, what we do is we say, if we can impose a uh, ramping charge on the thermal producers, that will then enable them to align their incentives with those of, of society. And then you will get the correct amount of 
storage capacity even in an imperfectly competitive setting. Because in, for example, also in PGM, their idea was that if you want storage to provide ancillary services, if you give them some kind of mileage payment, mm -hmm. or performance uh, payment that relates okay. to efficiency, yeah. then you could also kind of counteract any kind of weird yeah, effects yeah. where they would not want to do it uh, yeah. and, and have the, the best efficiency to provide the storage. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, uh, it would involve taking some kind of bi-level or tri-level approach yeah, yeah, yeah. So. to yeah, figure out what that parameter in the, at the producer level should be but a variable for the policy maker. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I was just wondering because you are you are assuming in your model like the the world has two periods mm. right mm. and uh, uh, I mean when you are a, you, you have a storage mm. let's say there is a value of wait and see right so I mean you are enforcing in your model that you have to use all your store energy uh, within these two periods. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any intuition about uh, what would happen if somehow you include in, the mo in your model the value of wait and see uh, in future well, periods? <clears throat> in, in a very indirect way, yes. So uh, we did some extra analysis. So I said we have an open loop approach. So we did a closed loop approach in which you would be able to anticipate, so it's not really a stochastic model, although you could make it like that, but in that you are able to anticipate the response in the second period and then adjust your production in the first period. And qualitatively, the, the results all hold. We can't prove them, them uh, analytically. We can't use the, the com prove the comparative statics analytically, but when we do the numerical examples, we have this turning point as well. Yeah. And in the same line of the assumptions, how much, I mean, the effect of all the assumptions that we have in Cornell model, yeah. do we have any idea how much these assumptions, I mean, they, they affect the, the solutions and the outcomes we have here? Yeah, good question. I mean, the only assumptions we made were that A2 is bigger than FA1. We have linear inverse demand curves. We have linear marginal costs. Um, and we had some condition for the interior solutions. But for imperfect competition, we have yeah. a corner model, yes. right? And it has some assumptions. Yes. Saying that the price and demand, they have a linear curve. But, but we know that it's not very I mean, realistic. Yeah. Do we have some ideas how much uh, is the cost of those assumptions? Sure. I mean, in a very basic level, we're ignoring things like unit commitment, right? And, well, I don't know how you would explore that in, a, in an analytical model. Rumteen has simulations for Texas where he's shown that ignoring these unit commitment decisions can affect not only the decisions, but also the emissions that are being produced from inefficient dispatch. Um, but otherwise, I mean, I think the, the, the two-period setting yeah. is perhaps general enough in the sense that no matter what kind of resource you look at, you always have a period in which you're sort of collecting the, the, the renewable resource and then trying yeah. to use it during some other period, whether it's hydropower in the spring melt yeah. and then the peak period coming later in the year, or uh, the duck curve from California, where you have all the solar production during the day, but then you need something for the evening peak and wind here. Yeah. Uh, where I mean, I agree with you. It's a stylized model for just basic arbitrage. It's just a, yeah. I have two time slots, and I have decisions to make on how I, I share. Yeah. And, and that's it. Right? Yeah. But how I, because I don't understand, I, mean, I don't know if I understand 100%. But how yeah. do you capture? your model, the, the fact that you will have to somehow recover the energy to, to, to keep you in business. I mean, it's like, I mean, as far as I understand, like you have a certain amount of energy in the yes. storage, yes. and then you distribute this certain amount of storage within That's the two it. periods. Yes. But how do you capture the fact that, for example, the efficiency will affect the way I will recharge my storage? Well, the efficiency enters into it with how you move the collected stock from one period to the next. That's it. It's not about the, the, the recharging. Okay. Yeah. I just say you start, you start the period with, with these D megawatt hours of energy and you decide how to use it. Yeah, because I, I'm thinking about, for example, a, a, a pump hydro storage. Yeah. Yeah. 
So at some point you will need the x to become negative to Yeah, we don't we don't have yeah, we don't have the initial charging decision. I just say you start with this much. Okay, that's okay. So yeah. that's what I understood. Yeah. So yeah. And, and you don't think that the recharging can have an effect because now mm, I'm very inefficient. Yeah. So if I'm very inefficient, I will have to pay more when it comes to pump up my yeah. My water. Well, I mean, the, the two are not going to be the same either, right? I mean, like the recharging efficiency and the, you know, the periodic losses, they are not they going are to be the same. Different efficiencies. Yeah, they're going to be different. In general, they're not going to be the same thing. So, I mean, I think that's, that's completely valid and it needs to, the model needs to be enhanced to take that decision into account. Where are you going to go and how are you going to recharge? And then that's going to add another layer of, complexity, but this can be thought of as maybe like a medium term model in which you know how much water is being allocated to you or how much energy is allocated to you from some long term planning model and then you decide how to use it in that season between peak and off peak periods. Yes. Can I ask you, it's, uh, it's more of a future work question, yeah. thinking of the, the tipping point, you have the, the last thing mm -hmm. which is intermittent renewable output. Yeah, I, yeah. I was just wondering if you, uh, I don't know, conjecture or expect that thanks to the uncertainty and bringing that in the decision making problem, somehow, even though this tipping point exists in a deterministic setup, people would not, uh, I'd say, feel it anymore or foresee it anymore because of the uncertainty in the renewables. So, so then they would still be ready to pay for increased right, efficiency. Right, yeah, yeah. Because they say, since I don't really know what's going to happen, I might as well be efficient in the way I'm going to store energy and release later. Yes, right? yes, precisely. So, I mean, there are other reasons why storage would be used, not just for uh, enhancing welfare or just for this... Pure it's arbitrage. just for arbitrage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There are other uses for exactly. For, so we would yeah. hope uh, that yeah, for ramping, this would relieving ramping costs and relieving. Yeah, or if you put charge. some ancillary service uh, yeah, kind of yeah. payment. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and initially we started this by saying, oh, this is going to be so simple. Uh, we will have a transmission. We'll have two nodes, transmission line, two periods, two kind of producers, and then the problem is with the transmission line you end up having so many corner solutions and so many interior solutions that you just can't get anywhere with the comparative statics. Yeah. So we got rid of it and we just had a single node. But I think it also goes towards the Pascal comment because eventually, so the arbitrage idea is the, the, the basic uh, concept for a market participant. That's what they will want to do. But somehow now that we start adding all these extra fun mm -hmm. features in there, we realize, okay, but it's much more of the system operator now that yeah. should take care of that because it's yeah. going to be ancillary services, management of uncertainties and so on. Yeah. So I think the more we go into these things, the more you want to push this to the system operator. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah, anyway, market participants will not want to bother with all these kind of things. It yeah. gets too complicated. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So, and, and I think the going back to that point uh, at the beginning is that I think the whole uh, conceptualization of storage is too rigid and perhaps based on regulation that hasn't kept up with uh, how technology has changed. So, you know, we need to think about how storage could be used by different players and, yeah. Some other questions? No? Yeah. Well, perfect time. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very so much. much. Thanks. Thank you both. Uh, we, we got very nice lectures. Uh, yeah. Good, uh, yeah, good thinking to start the morning and be ready for, for a nice afternoon. Um, so, yeah, thank you all. And uh, see you this afternoon for Christos PhD Defense. I think we start at one, right? Very nice. Yes, good, you too. Thank you.